I had a ha back there. That's great. Well, it's a blessing to be able to be here this morning. And uh, Pastor Dave, thank you for inviting us to speak about the mission this morning, which is our, our passion, uh, what we do in the Lord. And before I start, I just want to recognize a couple of, um, I don't want to say old friends, but friends from the past. Uh, Brother Dan, <laughs> raise your hand, and his father, Stan. Where's Robin? Did she? His wife, Robin, is here too, so you'll have to, yeah, you'll have to, she was here, but you'll have to say hi to her after we're done. Um, Dan and I went to high school together. We were on the debate team together, and his dad had me in 10th grade geometry. So it's, and he, and he remembered, he remembered that too, so it's amazing. I, that might be pushing it, but <laughs> I don't remember. Math wasn't quite my my forte, but um, it, it's a blessing to have you guys here today. And, and so it's, it's yeah, great. Well, um, I want to talk this morning about the biblical basis for helping the poor. I'm going to take about part of my time to do that, and then the other part of the time we're going to talk about um, Hope Gospel Mission. But... Um, the, uh, as, as Christians, we have a wonderful heritage of helping the poor that is laid down in both the Old and the New Testaments. And, and it's interesting because there's over 400 verses in both the Old and the New Testaments that talk about the poor. And uh, we're going to really have to hurry if I'm going to get all 400 in, but I, I'm just joking. But... Um, and there will be a test after, and if not, I'll have to give it all again. So I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, so, so I want to start out, and this, this is really the basis why we started Hope Gospel Mission, because the Bible talks so much about helping the poor and, and what our responsibility should be in that. So let me just start out with the Old Testament first. You're, you're probably familiar with a lot of these verses, but um, I'm going to try to tie them all together here today. So when God set up the nation of Israel, remember he took Abraham, who was a Gentile, a pagan, and, and start way, all the way back in Genesis chapter 12, and he started, he took Abraham and he said, I'm going to make a special people and a special nation out of, out of you. And, um, and he blessed him and did that. But um, when he set up the nation of Israel, God made provision for the poor among the Jews by allowing them to glean the fields. Everybody, anybody hear about gleaning, what that means? Well, um, let me just, Leviticus 19.10 says, uh, the Lord talking to Israel saying, and you shall not glean your vineyard. In other words, don't, don't pick it clean. Neither shall you gather every grape of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and stranger. I am the Lord your God. And so, People that were poor in the nation of Israel could walk through the fields. Remember the disciples did that? They went through the fields and they, they were picking the heads of grain. You couldn't, you couldn't stash it in your pockets or whatever they had back then. But you could, you could pick it and get a handful and, and eat that way. And that, that was part of their support system for people that were poor. And of course, that is how Boaz met Ruth um, in the book of Ruth. And uh, they also had what they called the law of the kinsman redeemer. And that was a male relative who had the responsibility to act for a relative in the family who was in danger or in trouble. So right off the bat, he, he built, God built that system into the, into the nation of Israel. Israel was also instructed by God that since they would always have the poor with them, they should always be ready to help them. Listen to Deuteronomy 15:11. It says, "For the poor, you shall always. I'm sorry. For the poor shall never cease out of the land. Therefore, I have commanded you, saying that you shall open your hand wide unto your brother, to the poor and to the needy in your land. And this included both Jews and the strangers that happened to be that happened to be the Gentiles that might happen to be in the land as well." Helping the poor in the Old Testament was a characteristic of a just or a righteous person in the Bible. Uh, Job is the classic example of this. He says in Job 29, 12, um, in verse 16, 12 and 16, when his friends were trying to accuse him, saying, Job, 
all this bad stuff happen for you. You, you, must be, you must have some hidden sin. And Job's defending himself, and he says this for the poor. Um, he says this, because I delivered the poor that cried and the fatherless and him that had none to help him. I was a father to the poor, and the cause which I knew not, I searched out. The book of Proverbs continues this theme. Proverbs 29, 7 says, The righteous considers the cause of the poor, but the wicked regards not to know it. A, cla a characteristic of a wicked person is they could care less about the poor, but a righteous person considers them. And Proverbs says this about the godly woman. The Proverbs 31 woman in Proverbs 31.20 says that she stretches out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reaches forth to the needy. A person also was either blessed or not in the Old Testament for considering the poor. Uh, this is one of my favorite verses. It's Psalm 41.1. It says, Blessed is he that considers the poor, that takes notice of the poor, and helps them. The Lord will deliver them in time of trouble. And Cindy and I have claimed that verse. A lot of times when we get in trouble, we'll claim that verse, and it, it works. <laughs> Proverbs 14.21 uh, says, He that despises his neighbor sins, but he that has mercy on the poor. Happy is he. And so that ties the idea of neighbors that are poor. We shouldn't despise them. We should, we should try to help them. Uh, if our neighbors are poor and we don't help them, it's a sin not to, is what this verse is saying. In Proverbs 19, 17, I like this. It says, he that, he that has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and he, the Lord, will repay. The Lord will repay you for helping the poor. I don't know how. Sometimes it's giving that money back so that you can give more. Sometimes it's just blessing you in other ways, but he, he promises to do that. Um, and then Proverbs 28, 27, a little sterner, says, He that gives unto the poor shall not lack. So there's, there's the idea of he'll meet your needs if you help the poor. But he who hides his eyes shall have many a curse. <laughs> I don't want curses. I don't know about you. <laughs> but uh, so it's, it's pretty, pretty strong, Word, worded pretty strong. And then it even goes to the level of the king. Proverbs 29, 14 says, um, the king that faithfully judges the poor, there's the idea that doesn't oppress the poor, that gives justice to them, his throne shall be established forever. And unfortunately, Israel didn't always follow these uh, admonitions. Israel was repeatedly warned and chastened in the Bible, in the Old Testament, for neglecting her poor. God rebuked them for being religious and going through the motions and fasting for the wrong reasons by saying this in Isaiah 58, 6 and 7. He says, Is this not the fast I have chosen? Is it not to deal your bread to the hungry and that you may bring the poor that are cast out into your house? When you see the naked, that you cover him and that you hide not yourself from your own flesh, your own people, your own, your own brothers and sisters in the Lord is what he's saying. And listen to this from Ezekiel. This is really strong. From Ezekiel 16, verses 48 and 49, the Lord says this, As I live, says the Lord God, Sodom your sister, whew, Sodom? Sodom your sister has not done, she nor your daughters as you have done and your daughters. Behold, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. But neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. When I read that verse, it was like, wow, I thought the sin of Sodom was homosexuality. That, that, and that is true. But they also neglected the poor. Really interesting. And so Israel had behaved worse than Sodom in not helping the poor and needy. Pretty, pretty heavy. And even pagan kings were commanded in the Old Testament to show mercy to the poor. Listen to this in Daniel 4.27. When Daniel, Daniel gave this warning to King Nebuchadnezzar, shortly before God made him a wild animal for seven years, remember that in the Bible? He was out pra praising the kingdom that he had built, and God 
turned him into a like a cow, you know, like an animal that went out and grazed, and his his toenails and and, and they, they grew really long, and he was just like a just like a wild animal. But listen to this. Um, he says this, Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto you, and break off your sins by righteousness, and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of your tranquility. <laughs> so even, even kings who are, part of, who are the government are told that they need to have mercy on the poor as well. So in summary, in the Old Testament, God has a heart for the poor and the needy, and he sets up safeguards in his law to protect them through providing work for the poor by gleaning laws so that they could find help and find dignity through work. Ruth would be the example there. Um, the kinsman redeemer, the kinsman redeemer, I'm sorry, and the right of the firstborn that appointed someone in the family to help poor family members that were in need. And, and there's, a, there's the example in Boaz helping Ruth and Naomi. God set up a system of indentured servitude so the poor, instead of starving to death, could go work. If you were poor, you could go work for somebody for up to six years and then be released. You could be their indentured servant. And that way, that prevented you from dying of starvation. And then after six years, that person had to release you. And remember, remember the example of Jacob when he, when he had to flee from his brother Esau? He went in and he worked for Laban for six years. He had to work for Laban for six years, um, and th then he got Leah. <laughs> and then he had to work, then, then uh, Laban tricked him, and he had to work another six years to get Rachel. That doesn't sound, doesn't sound like too good of a deal, but he, but he did it. So, uh, so anyway, there's an example of that. And then... He also set up a justice system that was supposed to allow the poor equal justice under the law to prevent them from being oppressed. And of course, the example of that would be the widow and the unjust judge. Remember, he could care less, he, he, but she, she bugged him, kept bugging him and bugging him, and finally he, gave her, he avenged her from the, the person that had oppressed her. So, so anyway, I want you to notice that in the Old Testament, individuals, families, and the government all participated together to try to minimize poverty in the land. But because of Israel's sin, it didn't work like it was supposed to work, and so many of the poor suffered. And as a result, God judged the whole nation because of it. However, many of these principles were carried over into the New Testament as well. The Lord Jesus taught us to love our neighbor as ourselves as ourselves. In the second greatest commandment, he, he, in, in Matthew 22, 39, he says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then he clarifies who our neighbor is in the parable of the Good Samaritan when Jesus asks the lawyer who is asking him the question about who, was, who his neighbor was, um, says this uh, in Luke 10, 36 and 37, he says, Which now of these do you think was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And the lawyer said, He that showed mercy on him. He got it. And then Jesus said unto him, Go and do you do likewise. Therefore, this parable clarifies that our neighbor is anyone who we come across in our daily lives that is in need of help. Pretty, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Jesus also helped the poor and taught that giving to the poor has eternal rewards. Uh, he says this in, in Matthew 11:5. He says, The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Jesus blessed the poor and needy not only by healing them and, and helping them physically, but also by giving them the gospel. And that's a principle that we carry forth even at Hope, we, we carried forward even into Hope Gospel Mission. We'll talk about that in a little while. Jesus says this in Matthew 6, 3 and 4. He says, but when you do alms, your gifts to the poor, let not your left hand know what your right hand does, that your alms or your gifts may be in secret and your Father, which sees in secret himself, shall reward you openly. 
It's the idea that don't do it for, don't give for show, but but give. Don't let your right left hand know what your right hand is doing. In other words, don't don't ask too many. Don't don't. If you see a need, just go meet it. Don't try to figure it out, and don't do it for show. And the Lord will bless you. And Jesus says he tells the rich young ruler in uh, Matthew 19:21. He says this. Um, to the rich young ruler, if you will be perfect or complete, go and sell what you have and give to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. Now, not that helping the poor saves us. This guy, his money was a god, and he needed to get rid of it and go follow Jesus so he could be saved. And, but, but it's the idea that, that um, Jesus here was telling him to go help the poor. And even... In the New Testament, in Matthew 25, 44 through, uh, through 46, Jesus warns that there will be judgment for those that didn't help the poor. And those people, remember, they, they're standing before God, and they say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto you? Then shall he answer them, saying, Truly I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these believers, you did it not unto me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So one of the, one of the characteristics of a righteous person that will have eternal life is they, they give and they help the poor. Jesus, also, Jesus and his disciples also gave money to the poor. Remember when the, the lady poured the expensive perfume on Jesus' feet? She just kind of ran up out of nowhere and put this expensive perfume on, on his hair and on his feet. Uh, Matthew 26, verses 8 and 9 says, But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation. They were mad, saying, To what purpose is this waste? <laughs> this, for this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. So see, they're thinking helping the poor, but... They got it wrong that time because that was for Jesus preparing him for his burial. And that woman got immortalized in, in the word of God for, for doing that. But the point is, they were giving and helping, they, they were conditioned into giving and helping the poor. And even when Judas left to betray Jesus during the Last Supper, and the disciples didn't get it that it was him, in John 13, 29, uh, says for some of them thought when Judas left because Jesus had the bag that Jesus had said unto him, buy those things that we have need of for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So the idea is they were used, Jesus gave to the poor. He not only helped them physically by healing them, giving them money, but also by giving them the, the gospel as well. Remember when Zacchaeus was saved in Luke chapter 19? Uh, he showed his repentance by giving half of his goods to the poor. And Jesus said unto him, this day, is salvation come to your house so the two are the two are closely um, tied together the Lord also commanded the Pharisees to invite the poor to their feast remembering they were just inviting all their friends to the feast that they would have and in in Luke 14 verses 13 and 14 Jesus says but when you make a feast call the poor the maimed the lame and the blind and you shall be blessed for they cannot repay you, for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. In other words, giving to the poor, you're laying up treasures in heaven. And so it's a wonderful thing. And of course, helping poor saints is seen as a special urgency in the book of Acts. Remember in Acts chapter 6, the, uh, the, Greek, the, the believing widows, the Greek widows, were getting neglected in the daily ministration of the, of the food or whatever it was that they were handing out. And so... The disciples picked out, the, the apostles picked out, had the, had the uh, believers in the church there appoint seven men to take care of that situation and, and make sure that the widows did not get neglected. And when, when there was a famine in Jerusalem and Judea, the surrounding region, in Acts 11.29, then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dealt in Judea. And Paul even says this about the other apostles when they recognized his apostleship in, in Galatians 2.10. Only they, the other apostles, 
would that we should remember the poor. In other words, you don't, you don't have to keep the law and be circumcised to be saved, but we want you to remember the poor and help them. So the Gentile believers actually helped the Jewish believers, which was a first because Jew and Gentiles were, were not, they were enemies, they were separated. And so now you've got the Gentile church helping the, Jew, the poor uh, Jews that were experiencing a famine in the main church in Jerusalem. So it's a, a wonderful thing. And finally, the, the apostle James even rebukes believers in the church there who are treating the poor disres disrespectfully. In James chapter 2, he says, And you have respect to him that wears the fine clothing, and say unto him, You sit here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand there, or sit here under my feet. Are you not partial in yourselves, and are and are, have become judges of evil thoughts. Can you imagine if poor people came in the church here and we said, uh, excuse me, you got to go out in the back there and sit on the floor. No, oh, the wealthy people, they can come right in and sit right down in the front and we'll come on in. That's, that's terrible. And so the Apostle James has to correct them for that. So in, in wrapping up, the consistent theme in the Bible on the subject of the poor in both Old and New Testaments is one of caring, concern, and responsibility to, to help. So God cares about the poor, and he expects us to do the same. And a person of, an, of integrity in the Bible, of character, cares about helping the poor. And God promises to bless those who help the poor, and God will judge those that neglect the poor. So it couldn't, it couldn't get any clear and there are a lot more verses I passed over but uh, but that's uh, that's what the Bible teaches on that so so anyway any questions on that otherwise I'm going to segue over and talk about hope gospel mission so um, so Cindy and I founded hope gospel mission in, in 1998 and God put it on our hearts at that time that there was no place in our community uh, for homeless men. Uh, if, if back then, if you were a homeless man back 20 years ago, what they'd used to do is that if you were, if you were lucky, you would get a one-night voucher from, to, for a hotel stay through the Salvation Army. And then they would, the police would kindly escort you out to I-94 if you wanted to go to Minneapolis or, or down to Madison or that area and drop you off so you could hitchhike somewhere else. <laughs> That's actually what was happening. And so the Salvation Army alone was getting about 20, 15 to 20 requests a month for uh, people that needed housing. And so, so what, we, what we did is we met with the local agencies. I, God had put it on my heart about five years before that to start the mission. But we were just starting our family, and um, I was running our family business. And I just just kind of put it off, put it in the background. But the Lord, every time I would drive by the building down on Farwell Street, because I had looked at it, I would come under great conviction that this is something that the Lord wanted wanted us to do. But you know how it is. It's like, well, Lord, maybe down the road, you know, when I... And so for, for five years, we just, you know, just the normal starting a family, working, you know, those those type of things as well. Well, finally, the opportunity opened up in 1998 um, to purchase the, I, I talked to the guy that was the owner and he called me, I, we talked out of the blue and he said, well, we're going to turn it into a food court and a restaurant and it didn't work out. And, uh, you know, anybody that's interested in buying it? And I'm like, oh, we got an open door here. And so, so being a businessman, it's like, well, I better check out and make sure there's a need in the community first. So that's, that's when we met with the different agencies and whatnot. And, um, and Cindy was great because we had two kids at the time, and she was homeschooling and being a mom. And so she, she, she was the one that actually named the mission, um, Hope Gospel. I, I was going to, you know, I'd have probably named it the Eau Claire Rescue Mission or something like that. <laughs> but, um, and I'll let her tell the story about that. But she chose the name Hope Gospel Mission. And... Um, and that's that's how we did. But she she enabled us to be she enabled me to be able to go out and do that while she took care of our kids for, and I know and she felt bad she couldn't help more. But that's, you know, that was an important thing. And so I, I appreciate that. So uh, 
So we, uh, we formed a board of directors in uh, the fall of 1998, and we purchased the former Ellie Phillips Senior Center, which was the building we just moved out of into our new men's facility uh, on, at, at, on Farwell Street in Eau Claire. And um, it took us about, we thought, oh great, you know, we're, we're, we're in now and we'll be open by fall. In the fall of 99 and, and uh, needless to say we were about a year off um, it took us about a year and a half we had to raise it raise about three hundred thousand dollars which was back then it was that was a huge well, it still is a huge amount but um, to raise the monies to remodel the building to hire our staff and uh, so we we were we were about a year off but we got we, we finally opened by the fall of 2000 uh, by offering 30 to 60 day emergency stays for for homeless men and in 1999 when we got possession of the building we started helping people we just couldn't let them stay there so we we had them we placed them in different churches we had at our church we had people coming to sleep in our sanctuary on the floor and that worked for a while until things started disappearing and the, the resident would the, the person we're helping would disappear and take some of the stuff with them and so it held all kinds of, of problems. We had a, we had an old Afri older African American gentleman watching who was a, had schizophrenia. We didn't know it at the time. He was paranoid, uh, watching the building for us. He was sleeping in his pickup truck, so we let him sleep on the couch in the office, and he was watching it for us. And and uh, uh, Dushan, uh, some of you might have met him. He's he's come a couple times here. He came by and he was a limo. Came by in a limousine and. He needed a place, so he, he helped us out. And it was just a real, we didn't know what we were doing, and it was real real loose in the beginning. But, uh, but we finally got it open and, uh, in, in 2000 and offering emergency stays. And it, but it didn't take long for us to realize that most of our residents needed more than just a job and a place to stay. So we started offering help with basic life scales, and, and that eventually led to us having a full-blown uh, year and a half program like we do now. In 2003, we we uh, got a fantastic deal on uh, on the old Cassidy's grocery store. Um, some some of you might have shopped there, and uh, eventually we opened that up, and and now our our bargain center is there, the Ruth House is there, and our auto sales is is there as well. And this allow this this provides the funding uh, for the mission. 75% of our funding comes from our stores. And uh, so, and then the other 25% comes from, from donations from the, the public and from foundations and businesses and things like that. Um, so in 2006, we opened Building Hope, which is a building reuse store. And we were doing that to provide job training. All our stores, the residents work in all the stores and we provide job training for them. Um, and so we opened Building Hope, and now we have two additional bargain. In, in anticipation of our expansion, we have opened in the last couple of years two new bargain centers, one in Mondovi, and one in in 2016, and one in Mondovi last or Menominee last year. So, and our budget um, has grown um, from about three thousand three hundred thousand dollars a year in um, 2003. To now over four million dollars, and all the money gets used to help. All the money gets used to help the residents. So, um, yes, we're a faith-based uh, evangelical organization. Um, we're, we're a rescue mission. You know the difference between a rescue mission and a homeless shelter. Lynn, you know. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and we, we rescue. Our, our motto is lives rescued, rebuilt, and renewed. Uh, but historically, the difference between a rescue mission and a home, homeless shelter is the fact that we preach the gospel. Every resident that comes through hears the gospel, the good news about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and how they, through faith in Jesus Christ, can have a new life in Christ. 
and have their sins forgiven and have eternal life. Amen? So, um, and we're members of an association of about 300 different rescue missions, and that's where we learned a lot of stuff. We, we network with them throughout the country. Um, we, we network with them and, and learn things. And, and, uh, and we, we, there's a lot of trial and error when you do this. So, um, And about 40% of our, our workforce is made up of volunteers which really helps keep our, our costs down and, of course, more money than able to go to the, the programs. Um, people get referred to us in many different ways, including agencies, hospitals, churches, friends, relatives, and, and on, our, on their own through our website. Uh, about 85 to 90 percent of the people that come to us have some sort of addiction, and they've lost their job and relationships and burned bridges as a result of that. About one-third have a, some type of a diagnosed mental illness, anxiety, depression, bipolar, ADHD, or just to name a few, the most common. Uh, most people have problems with relationships and either have strained or severed their ties with their families. Um, everyone that comes to our door um, has our, our program laid out for them and is interviewed to determine their eligibility. Uh, about one-third of the people that come to us don't feel uh, that they, they need a program. And so what we try to do then is refer them to another agency that might be able to help them, them better. Um, so how does our program work? Well, um, everyone that's accepted into our program starts out in our 30-day our or our short-stay program. And during this time, they have an evaluate to decide. We have a time to evaluate them, and they have time to decide if they're they're interested in our long-term program. It's a tough program. Um, it's a year and a half program. It's it's goal-based, so some people take longer, and some people can do it shorter. Um, and they must apply and be accepted to get in. Uh, people that decide to enter are are. Renewed Hope program will undergo about 40 to 50 hours of assessment, and then by our staff, and then have a personalized development plan worked out for them that they're, they're going to work on over that course of that year and a half. And each resident will spend a year working in our mission businesses and working on their development plan, which covers these eight areas. I'll just give them real quick: academics, uh, if they need to get a GED or get brushed up on their skills to get a job, we do that. Addiction counseling, financial literacy. We put everybody that comes through our program through the Dave Ramsey Financial Peace University. Some of you probably heard, heard of that. We work with them on job skills, life skills, mental health, nutrition and fitness, and spiritual growth. So those, those eight dimensions, we, we work with them. And we use our Solomon Learning, we, so we use the Bargain Centers and our Solomon Learning Center as a facility where we, we work on most, most of these things. Um, it's a safe place where they can work and fail. In other words, we can tell them, oh, you're doing this, that would get you fired in a normal job. So we need to work on that so that you don't get fired at some point when you get another job. Um, so every resident, attends a local church that partners with us and is assigned a mentor to help them. And this relationship or support system will hopefully continue once the residents leave the mission. All these services we provide at no cost to the residents. I have people come to me all the time and say, well, how much does your program cost? And I'm like, well, it, it doesn't. No, 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 how much? Do you take insurance? And I, no, 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 our, our problem, there is no cost. And at graduation, they will receive a $3,000 bonus, graduate or bonus to fund their emergency savings fund, and also a good running used car from our auto sales. And you know, you look at treatment facilities, you know, like Ellie Phillips and and uh, Hazelden and some of those. It's thirty to sixty thousand dollars a month to go to those programs. Even Teen Challenge, which is a great program, they charge and take insurance as well. We don't. We're all funded really by the Lord through the, you know, the donations from, from our, our faithful supporters. Um, about half of our former residents that complete the program um, that we follow up with a year later are still sober and employed. Um, 
and that's wonderful to see. The, the best part of it, I think, for Cindy and I is seeing the, the changes in the lives of the residents. Not everyone uh, graduates, but everyone is helped. And what we look at is the longer we have someone stay with us, the more we can help them because we're, we're giving them things, tools that they can use, life skills and tools that they can use. And if they'll apply those when they get out, they can live successfully as well. The top five reasons people don't complete the program are relapse, unfortunately, fear of working on the root issues of their problems. We really dig deep and get into all those root issues that are causing the problem. And some people, they get freaked out when you get to that stage and they don't want to do that and they leave. Unhealthy relationships. They're, they're drawn out, you know, they'll, somebody will, you know, a, a former friend or boyfriend or whoever, you know, if it's, if it's the women or opposite with the men, and they draw them out. Um, so, un, so unhealthy relationships, dangerous behavior, and theft. Um, and anyone that does leave, uh, if they reconcile, can, can eventually come back if, you know, if we feel they're, they're ready. So there are several ways you can help us, and we're going to show a little video here in a minute about, about how. But we are currently um, in the last phase of our capital campaign for hope, which we started in 2015. Um, our first phase was to raise $4.8 million to build a new men's facility on the west side of Eau Claire to replace our old Farwell Street building. And we successfully completed that project this spring, and we had the grand opening on May 30th. Yeah, praise, praise God. And we now can serve up to 48 men in the new Hope Renewal Center for Men, and that over doubles our capacity from what we had down at the Farwell Street, and it's a much nicer building, too. We're getting rave reviews from the men that stay there, <laughs> that have stayed in, in both. Um, our second phase, which we're in right now, is to raise $1.6 million to open our new Hope, Hope Renewal Center for Women and Children, and these are two care part, former care partner assisted living facilities. They're right across the street on Moholt Drive from the Bargain Center, back behind Quick Trip and where the old Mike Smokehouse was there on Farwell Street. The larger building will allow us to serve 11 women with children, which we currently do not serve that population. And, um, and this, the smaller building will help us serve up to 14 additional single women. And uh, we've currently raised about $300,000 so far, and we're really out in the community making presentations to foundations and businesses and a lot of different in individuals. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about that, Linda, where's Linda? There she is. And she's going to talk about volunteers here in a little while too, but we have a table out back with all that information. Um, so let's, if you have the video, Dave, um, can we cue that up? And then, um, then I think Cindy wants to say a few words, and then Linda's going to say a few words after that. So. Hope Gospel Mission exists to be able to help people become the beautiful people that God intended them to be in the first place. And we want what's best for them. I probably wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for this place. I had no reason to live anymore. I don't see how I would have survived if I hadn't on my way to the mission. Did you know as many as 400 children are classified as homeless in the Chippewa Valley alone? Services for homeless women and children is one of the greatest unmet needs in our community. Each month, Hope Gospel Mission turns away approximately three to four women with children seeking assistance for services that we do not currently provide. I was staying with a cousin of mine and I'm only supposed to be there for a month and I have to leave, so. I found the mission. It's just unfortunate that they don't have enough space. Even though they would like to help, they don't have a spot for me. The need is great. We want to help these women with children. We want to be part of the solution. Consider how you can be a part of our Campaign for Hope. Thank you to all of the partners who raised the funds to complete the Hope Renewal Center for Men. We are up and running, but our mission is not over yet. Our Hope Renewal Center for Women with Children still needs attention. We need the remainder of the $1.6 million to open our doors as soon as possible. You can help provide a safe and stable home for the hurting homeless women with children. We'd like to offer them consistent programming with nutritious meals. We need to provide them tools to break the cycle of homelessness. 
We need partners like yourself to come alongside to help those who want to start again and make a difference in their lives and the lives of their children. Will you partner with us to complete this special place for women with children? Together, we are accomplishing great things. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, this thing is really tall. <laughs> there we go. I'm really blessed to be here today to be able to come up here and speak my heart and speak my experience with what it's been like to work with the people at Hope Gospel Mission. God's called Mark and I 20 years ago, as you heard in his testimony, and um, it's been quite an experience. Uh, walking through this with the Lord and um, with the people that we have that do such a marvelous job. It takes more than us. It takes it takes so many people to make it happen. But um, I just want to say um, I'm blessed. And uh, one thing about I did I, one thing about speaking from your heart is you don't have a piece of paper to look off so my mind is going a million miles an hour to what to say there's so many things I could say but um, God has called us to help the poor and he is a good example he it's as you heard Mark say God wants us to care about the poor and the needy in our community and um, there are so many as you look out there. There's so many, I mean, around the world, the world's just full of, of, of sad and hurtful, just pain and suffering. But even in our community uh, where we live, in our backyard, it's there too. Um, where you, you need to look for it, it's there. It's there. So um, uh, we need to be... You, be an example. God has been our example, and Christ especially. And when He was talking about um, how Jesus, they poured the oil over Jesus' head. Jesus became poor for us, that we would be able to live. And He was so worthy of having that oil poured on Him, even though the disciples said, um, you know, it should be sold to the poor. Well, he became poor for us so that he could give us life. So amen that they used the oil all over Jesus to prepare him for what he was going to do. But um, anyway, I, I've had the privilege. Uh, well, one thing, through all the years, and Mark went through the years and stuff, 20 years ago we started the men's shelter, 10 years ago the Ruth House, and then there was something missing. We, 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 we got a heart for uh, realizing that there's another need in town, and that is for women and children. So it's exciting to know that finally that dream is coming to fruition. Um, well, we have a little ways to go, but we just know that God's going to provide for that, that, that we'll be able to help these women and their children. So we're just we're, we're trusting God by faith that he's going to provide all that we need. He has before. There's no reason why he's not going to again. So um, we're just trusting for that. Uh, and uh, but we do need help, and that's why we're here today to reach out uh, for whatever you can do. And it's not just monetarily. We, we, we need people to, um, to come and give of themselves, uh, to come and serve in any capacity. I've had the privilege of being a mentor to several women over the years um, in between raising our kids. Um, and, and by the way, we, we, we took that that love for the, 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 the lost and the homeless and the hopeless into our family. We went to India and adopted a child um, um, in 19, uh, what was it, 2004 we went, um, and we adopted our son Sujay um, and brought him in. He had no hope. He had no hope at all. He would probably not even be alive to this day if God wouldn't have opened the door for us to go and take him into our family and love him as our own. So uh, he's our little black boy, and uh, but he's, uh, <laughs> he's, our, he's our son and um, never thought of him as anything less or whatever. He's, he's part of us and seems to always have been, but anyway. Um, so back to the mentorship, I have mentored a couple women, and it, there's n nothing like it. So I, I, I've enjoyed taking these women from the lowest low to see them grow 
And the two that I had trusted in the Lord. I was really thankful that God just saved these two women that I worked with. Um, not all of them get saved that come to the mission, but these two women did get saved and trusted in the Lord. And I was able to, to help them grow, uh, to just be productive uh, people in society. And uh, the first one that I, that I had, she is now a, works for AAA, and she's doing really well. And she still, she loves the Lord, and um, I'm just really, I, I keep in touch with her. Um, and then the other one um, I'm still working with and, and through her struggles and, um, and trying to help her to grow. And it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. And it, it, it's, it, it's not for the faint-hearted because it's, it, once you take on a, a person to help mentor them, it's a big project. It's something that you pour your heart and soul into. Um, and you just love them with all that God gives you to love them with. And, um, and it's, it's a struggle sometimes, but uh, it's worth it because you see a person come up from the depths of, of despair to joy in Christ and, and a new life. And it's just a marvelous thing. So I pray for our church that sometime soon that we would have an opportunity to open the doors to um, hosting and having people from the mission come and, and fellowship with us and that there would be some that would be uh, mature and, and desire us to take them on as mentees and, um, and, and, and help them grow in Christ. That would be, uh, uh, that's a goal that I just hope to see in our body and um, it's, it's just a, a marvelous thing. So anyway, I just wanted to speak from the heart and just tell you I, there's so much more that could be said. But Linda's got to get up here too, and we want to want to be here all day. So anyway, um, it's oh, a you know, <laughs> it's a it's a beautiful thing to watch God move the heart and the life of somebody. I mean, as you saw in the, in the thing, some of these women that were speaking were tearful, and they're at the end. In fact, one of them was going to go out and kill herself. And that was going to be the end. But God saw fit to, to, to pull her out of that and bring her to the mission. And she is serving in the mission now. She, uh, she's uh, a marvelous witness of what God can do in a person's life, even when you, in, you're, you're at the depths of despair. So anyway, um, thank you, Jesus. We're, just, we're thankful for um, all that he's doing and all that he's going to do in the lives of people. So thank you for letting me talk. <laughs> Everybody. I'm really short. <laughs> anyway, hi, I'm Linda Vealy. I'm the Community Relations Coordinator for Hope Gospel Mission, and um, I do public relations, and I also do volunteer um, promotion. I'm looking for volunteers. Uh, thank you, Pastor Dave, Dave, um, and congregation for having us here today. Um, and I just must say, uh, the Donnellys are just such blessings blessings I am so honored so feel so privileged to work for Hope Gospel Mission um, not only the Donleys but uh, the board the executive director the directors all my co-workers I love them they love Jesus and it's so I've, I've had a lot of jobs in the secular world and and this is yeah right Pammy it's awesome Awesome to be able to um, you know, having a hard day and go to a coworker or a volunteer or, you know that loves the Lord and be able to pray and that's you know pretty neat thing. Um, there are four ways that you can give. Um, one is pray, pray for Hope Gospel Mission. Um, the other way is to donate, and that's donating financially or donating to one of our stores. I turn around that and get money and and it helps the residents and the third way what's the third way um, <laughs> uh, that's a fourth but yeah y yeah well okay but volunteering what yeah you can work there yeah we actually we just had a job fair um, you can uh, we we do have uh, several positions opening as we're growing um, um, yeah we need a lot of help and then also volunteering. We need lots of volunteers. Um, like uh, like uh, we had mentioned before, 40% um, of our, our labor costs is uh, volunteers. That offsets the labor costs. So there's a lot of different positions open. 
we we need help at Frank Street right now. That's one of the the um, areas that is a huge need. We'd really love to uh, raise the funds and and get that remodeled by September. It's such a huge need, huge need in our community. Uh, we have three to four women with children coming to our doors a month and looking for for shelter for a home, and we have to turn them away. That's really hard. So. Um, yeah, we need help there. There is um, some information back at the back table. Please come back and see me. I'll tell you a little bit more. I won't take up more any more time. So God bless you all. Thank you. And I think the third area, third area is shopping at our stores. That's easy. Everybody can do that. You, you can go, you know, husbands, you can take your wives there and not have to worry about walking out spending hundreds of dollars. You know, it's, <laughs> you, you can, but building hope, no, you can. But, uh, but no, anyway, we, we have a great, uh, the, the Lord has just blessed us so much with great staff and volunteers and I'm just so we couldn't do it obviously with without them so um, any questions you might have um, one of the biggest needs we have right now is for some skilled or semi-skilled laborers to go in and help um, you know with some things that ordinary volunteers couldn't do um, well plumbing um, what else Linda um, yeah that that type of stuff more than just the normal um, gluing, you know, uh, what do they call it? The, the uh, molding, yeah, the, the baseboard molding, you know, that type of stuff too. But if we had a few people that could, you know, come in regularly, just a few hours a week and help with that, that would be great too. But Linda's got the information in the. In the bag. No. Yeah, Cindy and I are volunteers as well, and I, I think the best benefit for us is seeing the, the residents come in and then seeing them change as they go through the, the program. So, Denise? That's a good question. I'm not, uh, I don't think I have a number right off the top of my head. So, yeah. Yeah, and we... We don't, I think one of the reasons we don't count it is we don't count our success by graduates. We count our success by the, the longer we can have them, the better. And, and we've had a lot of people that don't graduate. Mo most people don't. And so they'll, but I, I run into them a year or two or three later and they're, they, they're doing well. They, they, some, some aren't doing well, but some are. But they, they took the tools that they used and applied them and so we, we go by time rather than numbers of how many graduate and whatnot. But uh, we're, we'll probably have about, we probably have, I would say, about six to eight a year that graduate. And now, we used to be able to only hold up to 20 at our other facility. Now we can, we'll be able to double that. Um, so that'll really help, but good, good question. Darren? Yes. Yes.
Yeah, I remember that. Yep. Amen, brother. I just had a couple more things that I wanted to share that are exciting to me that, that I found as far as serving. If any of you have an interest in serving, here's some simple things you can do to help at the mission. Um, if you want to help the women, usually we have women helping women and men helping men. It just goes better. Um, it, you, you can go as a group, though, and have it mixed. But some of the things that I've done are... Um, the, the blanket tie. Now I know that the ladies were here yesterday tying blankets and they they tie blankets for the new and upcoming women and children shelter and I was just so it, it's exciting so we need to keep that up and, and invite other people to do it so that these children that come in and these women that come in with their children all have a blanket some of them never had a blanket so those are that if you know how to tie blankets tie blankets like crazy because we could really use a lot of them to give to these people that come and uh, it'll it'll just the the joy you'll see on their face is just incredible to have something that belongs to themselves that they've never had another thing is is um, come and make meals making meals for the ladies oh my goodness it's so much fun because then you can go and you can eat with them you can talk with them. You can get to know them. You can find out where they're at. You can be befriend them. Um, and, and there's a lot more that can happen beyond that. And, and, um, and you could do the same with the men, um, if you're a man. And um, let's see, what were some of the other things? Um, at Christmas, I like to do uh, some special things with the ladies. Um, so there's things at holidays that you can do. Um, so anyway, those are a couple things that, that I was thinking about that are simple things um, to, to do, to plan maybe a tea party or plan, you know, to go and take them, um, have a barbecue with them or whatever. They love that. They love when people come in and they take the time and they provide this and they like to share their lives with them. So simple things, you're looking for something simple that you want to do. Um, those, are, those are really good things that you can think about um, and bring groups bring groups of people um, do it as a group because there's a lot of support in that and um, anyway I just wanted to share that because you don't have to think so hard there's so many little things and so many so many uh, easy things that will just bless them so much and you you come away 
which is the joy of the Lord because you're doing it because you love him in Christ and you're doing it you know, to serve God and there's just nothing like it. So anyway, I had to say that. All right. And I just wanted to uh, encourage you in a few things. Uh, one, like I bought this at the bargain center. I actually bought this at the bargain center too. So, uh, uh, and it's it's it, and it's a not yeah there too yeah all right yeah um, and and I go there at least once a week and I just interact with some of the staff I see some of the residents there I get to pray with people there I get to meet people there and share Christ with them and it's funny how God puts those people in your path to do those things when you're intentional about it I. I I know. Well, thank you for that. Um, but I, I wanted to say there are a lot of different ways to interact in ministry, and particularly with this. And God's laid it on my heart. And it's part of our DNA of, our, of this church that Christ is building. Uh, but I did want to preface things by saying, if we don't get the vertical relationship with God right, who cares about the rest of it? Okay, because our good works apart from Christ are not good. Okay, Brother Mark got to, when we were going through the Core Values series, he said, you know, in the We Serve message, he said, if you're doing good works apart from Christ, they have no eternal significance. So our good works, if they're just done in and of ourselves, probably for ourselves, that stuff ends at the grave. And, and that doesn't honor the Lord. And so Mark had kind of mentioned in John 12, with the, the woman that wanted to anoint Christ and, and notice the order there. He said, the poor will always be with you. You will always have them, but you will not always have me. Now, in that moment, the, the woman is specifically and bodily anointing Christ. But look at the order. He goes, look at me first. Okay? He goes, look at me first as what you are giving to or serving or being generous in and then and then yeah go take care of the poor and so if we get this order right if we are loving God with all of our heart mind soul and strength part of the outpouring of that then is that you will have the eyes of Christ where he says you know have ears to hear have eyes to see he says that I always used to wonder like why in the world would he say that if you have eyes of course you can see if you have ears of course you can hear but if we don't have the eyes and ears to see because we don't have the mind of Christ, then we're not going to see the things that God lays out in front of us. Places where we're able to help to, to rescue, rebuild, and redeem through the gospel. And it's not, here's a place to live, here's some food to eat, here's a shower, here's a job. It's, here is the Lord, and he wants to redeem your whole life. And there's eternal value in that. I want to just give a shout out to my brother Tom. Uh, Tom was at the mission, right? Tom was at the mission for a while, and I had the privilege of being there for him. And he's a member of this church. He serves in the body. He's sharing Christ with people that are in similar situations to where he came from. And let me tell you something. He can minister to people that are in the middle of addictions in ways that I can't. Because they'll look at me and be like, Dave, you're white bread, grew up on a farm. Like, you've never even had a speeding ticket. You don't understand where I'm coming from. But a guy like Tom can walk in and say, man, I've been there. I've been methed out. I've been homeless. I've had the, the estrangement relationships. I've had all of that. And people are like, really? Then why are you the way that you are? And he tells them. And so Hope Gospel is not just about housing and clothing and, and feeding, but it's about redeeming for the purpose of seeing that in other people's lives. Amen? And it's all because of, of, of Christ. It's because of the work that Christ has done in and through Tom to bring Tom to where he's at now so that he can have a ministry as well. And so, so I just want that to be something that we preface this with. 
Because like Mark and Cindy, I know you guys wouldn't turn anybody away that would do carpentry, or Linda wouldn't turn anybody away that wants to help donate some items or some money. But man, it's so great to hear to say, I'm compelled by the cross. I'm compelled by the gospel to go and do these things. Because it shows obedience and adoration to my Father when I do these things sacrificially as an act of worship. Amen? Now, think and pray about these things through the course of this week. Go visit Linda's table out front. Don't be afraid to go to the bargain center. Let's volunteer. I would love for us to be one of the partnering churches that brings people from the mission into here so that we can minister to them and see them turn into like the other Toms where they are reproducing believers. And, and, and this week, as you pray for those things, say, God, move me in my life so this is a burden on my heart. And not only will that move you missionally into what God is doing, but it helps you take the focus off yourself a little bit, which is a blessed thing. Because otherwise you get wrapped up in this and, oh, what about me? What about me? What about you? What about the neighbor? What about the neighbor? And so think and pray about that. And also, contact somebody that wasn't here today. <laughs> and be like, dude, you missed it. Don't, don't rely on YouTube to be a part of what we're doing here as we gather. And say, hey, you, you missed something very important, something very special, something maybe, and I'm praying that it's pivotal within the life of our church so that our hearts are turning towards the, the, the least of these, the lost, the lame, the blind, the sick, the addicted, the, the lonely. Amen? Because otherwise it's just about, oh, I went to church on Sunday. No, 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 no. <laughs> so. But these are the things that we need to be about. Amen? Amen? All right. We're not going to do the last song because we've been here for a while. I hope that's okay. Uh, but I do want to pray for you all that, that you sense a leading in the spirit that you find in God's word. And just say, the, the gospel has, has more of a, a, an influence in, a, in, a, in a, a, a broad brush stroke than we give it. Like it eternally changes a person because we, through it, are eternally saved apart from the eternal wrath of God that we deserve. And it saves us into glory. And it saves us into the presence of God here now. He, if you are a believer, he has taken a presence in your life. Amen? Do we let him move in that? <laughs> Amen? Do we allow the Holy Spirit to move us into redemptive works like we've talked about? Or do we quench him? God, I'm not going to do that. No. Nope. What do we say? I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you for this. I'm going to anoint you, God, and, and, and allow you to carry out the rest of what you desire in and through and around me. I'm going to trust you for that, God. How great would it be for us to say in the future, oh, you guys have a shortfall at the mission? We're going to take care of that. Oh, you have residents that are not being discipled or mentored or cared for right now? Bring them on over. You, you need carpet laid? Don't talk to Dave. Talk to Andrew. He, Dave doesn't know anything about that stuff. But we can help you. We, we want to be there. Like we get to be the actual hands and feet of Christ in the community. So that, now hear this, so that God is glorified through us. So that God is glorified through us. And for that, we need hearts beating after the Lord of peep, actual people that, that are desiring to give of themselves. And remember, Jesus said, you know what? You have to love me more than everything else in order to follow me. Now, remember that. You have to love me. He's like, unless you actually, in comparison to the love for me, if you don't hate father, mother, sorry, dad. If you don't hate father, mother, sister, brother, wife, husband child if you don't hate that stuff even your own life this is in the gospel this is the good news if you don't hate that stuff in comparison to jesus he goes you can't follow me you can't follow me now when you see people that are walking this out it's because they've said i've left everything else 
to follow Christ. Now you get the benefit of good relationships, you get the benefit of fellowship and worship and gathering, but it costs you your whole life. But you gain everything in it, in Christ, amen? And so I'm gonna pray, I'm gonna pray that God's doing something here, and that when we talk more about this in the future, like, like I'm, I'm just praying like everybody's in, in unity and agreement, say let's do this. Let's do this. Yeah, it might be starting out small. That's fine. I think God loves to work in the margins anyway. But let's do this. Amen? And I don't want it to be like, oh, he's fired up up there. No, I want you to be, I prayed about it and I'm sensing that God is saying, now you need to go here. You need to take a, take a step of faith and go in love like this. You need to take a step of faith and go out and speak courageously about this here. And it's all of God, and it's all for God. Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you, Lord, that we could have this time where we, we looked at the heart that you have for those that don't have.